And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Lads, I don't know what film you were watching, but it wasn't <laughs> the same film I saw. I'm all the man you need, bro. Yeah, I was, I was pretty shocked and appalled. Uh, I saw I'll Bring the Duct Tip. It wasn't a very good movie. I laughed at it more than I laughed at The Possession. <laughs> <laughs> good evening and welcome to Is It a Bicycle? Season 7, Episode 11. The original and bestest ever TV and movie podcast from Ireland. My name is Stephen Wrigley and I'll be your host for this evening. Beside me is a man who always gives his extra money to charity, as he says she's usually on the stage at about 11. <laughs> it's Mike McDonough. McDonough. Joining us this week, live from Vegas, we have a man who says when it comes to fucking around, I don't fuck around. It's Sean, I love cans, <laughs> Leonard. Yes. Uh, this week, we're once again joined by a lady who is disappointed that she's not famous enough yet for her own nudes to be hacked and released. It's Sean, <laughs> I love Canada, <laughs> of Flaherty. <laughs> This week, we hope to discuss some movies in the form of Startup and What If, and some TV in the shape of Intruders and Bojack Horseman. Of course, we'll have uh, the news with Sean, and some previews in Coming to a Bicycle near you. So, how are we doing? Fantastic. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you very much, Steve. Mike, we missed you so much. Yeah. It's just not the same. <laughs> Our listening numbers just plummeted, dude. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I did listen to uh, one of the episodes. Uh, it sounded kind of harsh. You know, the, the, <laughs> I detected a lot of tension in there. <laughs> um, I, I feel like some friendships were broken. <laughs> <laughs> it's been very dramatic. Yeah, the glue that holds us together, Mike. <laughs> so I hope you don't yeah, mind this since you weren't thing. here. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Leave it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to say, Mike, yeah. I hope you don't mind. You weren't here, so you've been volunteered as the host for the zombie apocalypse. So oh, great, I'll, I'll great, bring cookies. Yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Because uh, we can always do with some bait, you know, if we need to make a run for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so, what have we been watching this week, people? Mike, start with you. Um, I finally got around to seeing The Haunting in Connecticut. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, this is one we reviewed a while back, isn't it? No, yeah. we reviewed uh, Haunting in Connecticut 2. Oh, right. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, the... Uh, this one had a real structural problem in that Katie Sackhoff wasn't in it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, that's why you didn't watch it the first time. Yeah. Uh, now I'm waiting for two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they could do better. Yeah. But uh, yeah, for a movie that was very well thought of um, at the time, I was a little disappointed. Um, an awful lot, awful samey, you know, slamming doors and ooh, spooky man, scary faces. Mm. Uh, yeah, I just didn't feel the love for it. Yeah. Yeah. So if I have to go back in time and review that movie, uh, I'll probably not give it a good score. Nah, I see. That's, um, that's so weird, given that it has the most boring name for a film I've ever fucking heard. <laughs> <laughs> a Haunting in Connecticut. <laughs> good, I know the geography of the story. Excellent. But Connecticut is so scary, Sean. <laughs> Connecticut. Oh, for, not for those reasons. Well, that, that's why they, they really switched it up and fucked with your head by putting the second one in Georgia and still calling it Connecticut. <laughs> oh, sweet Jesus. I do remember you having a problem with that, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it all gets smoothed over as with the passage of time. So who saw uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World? Yeah, man, that was me. That was on television last week. Yeah, I man. love, I love that film. Yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's I love awesome. It. It is awesome. It's uh, like a comic book um, brought to uh, our cinematic pleasures. Uh, and it's based in Toronto. Like, it's based in the neighborhood in Toronto I, I lived in, um, which I love. It's like all the haunts he goes to. Even the phone booth he makes a phone call from. I'm like, I drink coffee in there. I made a phone call in there. I bought records in that store. Uh, and it's also kind of just making fun of, um, in some ways, like the hipsters in Toronto because they are rife. Uh, and the movie is just hilarious. It stars Michael Sarah. And I well, love it. Was that it. your card pinned up on the phone booth? It was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was one that uh, was released. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got into some shady dealings and yeah. had to leave the country. <laughs> That's actually, that film, Scott Pilgrim, is a big bone of contention with me and Mark. We were living together at one point, and I was like, oh, let's watch this. Like, it just came out on DVD. And he was like, fine. And he, his main enjoyment from the film came from saying how shit it was and getting me angry. <laughs> I think that I think what it was 
was that he the the incredible visuals, uh, both in terms of humor and the video game style yeah. that was being applied to both the storyline and the characters, the way that they act and the yeah. way that they were shot. It just confused him. Just his eyes were tired, probably. Uh-huh. That you know, like as you get older, it's tough to be able to focus on more than one moving <laughs> item at the same time. You That's and me, Sean, we're young enough to get it. I've always felt. <laughs> No, but the movie movie's awesome. Like, there's that part, you know, where um, they're like, "You punch the you punch the blue streaks right out of her hair." <laughs> like the one asshole that you know gets caught by the vegan please because he drinks half and half. Like, it's just it's so good. Brandon Routh is an amazing <laughs> comedic actor, and people should use him more. Yeah, it's just good from start to finish. So that was my my joy yeah. watching this week. Very good. Strangely enough, I think I kind of liked that when it came out. Which right. is not like me at all. Nah. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Yeah, I feel kind of ashamed to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm beginning to think that the person who has opposite taste to me might be more Mark and Mike. We are perhaps aligning in some kind of weird <laughs> lunar S- separated at birth, yeah. <laughs> celestial event here. <laughs> um, this week I saw um, "Are You Here" mm-hmm. uh, with Are Owen here? Wilson and Zach Galifianakis. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just out. Well, just out here. Um, it's about two buddies, and uh, w- they travel to Zach's hometown um, after his dad dies, and he happens to inherit many dollars, much to the annoyance of his sister, who's played by Amy Fowler. Did I get that right this time? Polar? Polar. The famous and well-known actress Why did she spell it Fowler, then? Yeah. P-O-H-L-E-R? P-H. P-H. Steve can't read. P-O-H-L-E-R. So... His, uh, so also his stepmother, uh, stepmother, stepmother sort of hangs out and, uh, becomes the center of attention. It's played by Laura Ramsey. Well, hmm. she was center of attention, in my opinion, anyway. <laughs> and, uh, and then the trials and tribulations of such a setup. Is it a comedy? It sounds like it would be it with is, that cast, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the third film in about that many years, in less than that many years, actually, that Zach Galifianakis' main storyline began because his father died. Hmm. How is it? The other films would be, glad that you asked, the other films would be <laughs> Due Date, starring Robert Downey Jr., uh, and also uh, The Hangover Part 3. There you go. Interesting. Hmm. He also yeah. stars in a Fiona Apple music video. <laughs> FYI, everybody. The new two Kanye West take off as well, where he's pretending to be a farmer driving a tractor but being cool. <laughs> Did you see that? No, no, no? Oh, it's worth looking up on YouTube. It's very funny. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm so. wondering which is going to happen first: whether I master how to pronounce his name, or whether I enjoy one of his movies. <laughs> <laughs> Taking I, bets I, now. <laughs> I really enjoyed this one, and I'd go as far to give it a uh, seven. Mm. Yeah. Nice. yeah, it was good fun. I will watch that film based on your recommendation. Good man, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. yeah. For any <laughs> listeners out there, that's how it fucking works, right? When you say we like it, go fucking watch it. And then you tell us about it after. Jesus. Get I'm on that any bicycle, shit today, guys. I've yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, okay. First off, let's go to the news with Sean. New flight of the Concords show, kind of. It's been five years since Jermaine and Brett uh, ended uh, their flight of the Concords HBO TV show uh, with its second season. But apparently, uh, Jermaine Clement revealed to The Guardian that there's a new four-episode comedy coming from the duo. Uh, it was apparently supposed oh. to be out this year, but they were busy with other projects. So uh, look for that coming next year. I thought you'd like that one, Steve. Absolutely, yeah. Woohoo! Uh, speaking of things coming back that were not around for a while, there's going to be a new The Tick TV series. No way. Yeah. Patrick Warburton, uh, is reported, uh, to be in talks to revive, uh, The Tick live action TV show as an Amazon pilot. Cool. Yeah. For anyone wondering, there's a number of Amazon, uh, pilots that are available for free viewing on their streaming network right now. Another uh, lovely piece of news about a thing coming back. Remember the greatest American hero? Yeah. Uh huh. Well, well, the guys behind uh, the Lego Movie and Twenty One and Twenty Two Jump Street 
are apparently going to revive the franchise. Yay. Yeah, they're going to bring back the greatest American hero, believe it or not. I hope it stands the test of time. Uh, and then the, the final piece of news, I won't belabor it with witticisms like Mark usually does. Uh, the final piece of news is that Dwayne The Rock Johnson, after months of teasing and titillating his Twitter followers, has finally confirmed that he will be playing the comic book anti-hero Black Adam in an upcoming DC film based on the Shazam slash Captain Marvel properties. That's all from the news desk, Steve. Back to you where you are, which is in the studio. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sean. Um, yeah, okay, so let's kick off with the first of our movies, which is Start Up. Sean. Uh, a young offender uh, skips juvie and goes straight to grown-up prison, uh, which the, ter- the slang term for which is called being stared up. He gets there, he's got a lot of anger problems, but guess what? The status quo in the prison is being upset, and there's a bunch of people who don't like that, including his father, who's in the same prison. Very good. Mm. So this is uh, about Eric Love, the young offender, and his dad, Neville. Eric played mm-hmm. by Jack O'Connell. Uh, might remember him from Skins. He played no, James never. Cook. Yeah. Ooh. And uh, his dad, Neville, is uh, Ben Mandelson. We last saw him in Place Beyond the Pines, I believe. Do you wow. remember that? Was he was he the guy in the shack? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We loved him in yeah, that. Yeah, we did. We yeah. thought he was class. We did, indeed. Yeah, he's one of the best characters in it as well. Yeah. Um, so... I love this. I'd say straight off. <laughs> Get it off your chest. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and... Just come out, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. There's an immediate sense of tension in this, even from the, the start. Mm. Young offender being brought to adult prison, mm. going through processing, mm-hmm. going into a cell for the first time. Starts as hard time. It's like mm. they started, okay, day one, scene one. And tension. <laughs> Let's roll. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I love this. Um, what do you call it? Uh, ben Mandelson almost stole the show, mm-hmm. but I think uh, Jack O'Connell's uh, performance was so strong uh, that I think he was the the winner in this one. It was fantastic, really good. What do you think of this? I don't think I liked it as much as you did, Steve. Oh, really? Um, I will say the the opening sequence where there's no talking for an extended period, mm-hmm. is, is very strong. Um, a lot of very good visuals, and it kind of portents the evil that lies within. Yeah, and I don't know. I've never been to jail, but I, I was kind <laughs> of watching him go through the processing and thinking, fuck, I'm glad I'm not in jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really does set the scene, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 big time. But strangely enough, after setting that scene, it's almost like you get uh, inured to it you start to forget about the horror of the place that they're in as the, as the movie goes on. Um, I don't know if that's the human capacity to make things normal after a while. Yeah. Uh, you, you get used to hanging. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it lost that potency, I felt, as the movie went on. Um, but I suppose that's a tribute yeah, to the characters I'd taking over, you know. I'd agree with you at a certain point, but at times there was like clanging of gates in the background and yeah. stuff like that. It was sort of like, oh god, yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> or there, there might be there might be nothing happening in the foreground, and in the background you see some guy thumping the head off someone else. You yeah. know, yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> Jesus. The way that they used sound in this movie, I didn't think they were really using it that much until I realized that every time they had a visual hmm. that like required, there was a very specific visual reference that they did in the middle of the movie and uh, at another time during the movie as well, just of the revolving door. Yeah. The, the clanging of that, and that is a metaphor for prison. If you get out, you know you're going back. Like, the idea that all, so many people are repeat offenders in prison, and that hum of noise and violence that goes throughout the movie, there's a moment when they, when that lessens to a degree where you go, holy fuck, the past 90 minutes, this has been what I've been listening to. And I have. I've just grown inured to it. I've literally just gone, yeah. that's just how this sounds great. And that wasn't a lack of attention to detail, but it ended up just being subtlety, which I think is a word that describes so much of this movie, mm-hmm. um, despite the fact that it's so much of it is just graphic violence. Yeah. You know? 
I think like the best uh, the reason that I think Jack O'Connell takes it, and this is also in uh, up to the director as well. But when he's walking in, going through the motions of take off your clothes, come out, bend over so we can check if you have anything up your arse, get back inside, put on the like he knows every single step of those movements. Yeah, he's done this so many times before that at a certain point when a guard is like treating him lightly. And he's still doing the movements when he stands and looks straight at a wall because he expects that's what he's supposed to do. Yeah. And then he just can't understand, well, I can just like stand here, like chill out and just walk in front of you. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I just thought all of that was so really subtle and it didn't require dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And, and is the tension in the film then between the inmates? Just the prison as a whole, the situation. Right. Li- life in well, prison kind of thing? I, I got from it anyway. Yeah. It's just like it, it, it feels like prison. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, it's it's probably the best prison drama. I know I know we've had a lot of them, but I, I think the the one that I would compare it to is uh, the French movie that we released or the reviewed last year, La Profette. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is the next next one to it in terms of uh, being good. I, I, I think you're forgetting uh, <laughs> For a lack of words. series, uh, Prisoner Cell Block H. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. And <laughs> um, there's two other I, characters in this actually that I really liked, and that is the the uh, what's his name, Rupert Friend, mm-hmm. who mm, plays uh, Oliver Bomer, who's um, he is the uh, counselor in there. Uh, he's a great character. Um, we've seen him in Homeland actually re- very recently, and um, actually he was in Pride and Prejudice as well. Now you're uh, talking my language. Who yeah, was he in Pride and, and Prejudice? The boy in the striped pajamas. As well, so um, and Sam Spruel, hope I got that right. Uh, who played the governor? He was uh, Quincy in the last ship. Yes. Yeah. Well spotted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's quite a few familiar faces, you know. Even Ben Mandelson initially was sort of going, "I know him. Mm-hmm. I just can't place him. <laughs> yeah, I know him from somewhere." And then eventually he was like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah." Uh, um, to answer your question a little bit more, Shona, I think that the tension in it and one of the main things that this movie is examining is young men and especially young men with just difficulties, whether that's previous baggage uh, or people generally treating them like shit, which is often the story of people in prison, and also just with literal anger issues, you know? And there's this counseling group that becomes one of the focal points of the movie, uh, led by Rupert Friend. And just to see this, this, there's this weird thing where it's almost like the other guys who've been in the group for a lot longer than Jack uh, O'Connell, than, uh, than Love has been in. It's almost like they're learning these strategies for how not to beat the shit out of someone. Like just at a very basic yeah. level, how not, when someone calls you a cunt, which is, was used in this movie so many, more times than any film maybe ever. Yeah. When someone insults you, how to not just go, right, I'll glass go to prison for that. Yeah. I'll glass a guy just for that. Right. You know? Yeah. And it was, that was the tension for me was at any moment, like someone stands up uh, at a certain point in this, uh, in this group and that becomes something that could cause these six guys to beat the shit out of each other. Someone stands up. You know, why are you standing up? Why are you looking at me? You know what I mean? Right. And just seeing them learn, uh, like, things from each other and how to just not be enemies to everyone, you know, was just, that was a really uh, great part of the movie. And I was wondering how that would feed into the ending. Like, is there hope for anyone? Like, is this something that's going to happen? Because it's a father-son story, and it's also just a story about men. And it's, yeah. I don't know. And, uh, yeah, the, you mentioned hope there. Um, it, it did seem quite hopeless, for Eric Love, uh, several stages, especially one. Uh, there's one stage that remind me of uh, a scene from Bronson. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, where he gets an altercation with some prison guards, runs back to his cell, yeah. covers himself in oil and the floor, mm-hmm. and then breaks off the table legs mm-hmm. and sort of tools himself up, waiting for these guards to come yeah. after him. And they, he knows they're coming Jesus. in with like uh, shields and helmets, mm-hmm. and but he, he's not. He's only a young lad, like, mm-hmm. and he knows that he, he he's he's just going to. Give it a go, you know that kind of way. It, it's just yeah. nuts, mm. nuts. But you can see, like the, he's still a kid. Yeah. He's, you know, mm. but <clears throat> you can see that he's he's kind of breaking it, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, at, at that stage you're sort of going, oh Jesus, what? Where's the hope here, you know? Yeah. But you you see very very quickly uh, from the counselling sessions that 
that they're brilliant and uh, mm. there is some you know for everyone you know. and, and it was so weird and vast the way that at certain points they're just talking about race they're talking about race and different cultures just like but through the lens of these men yeah and they also talk about like homophobia also becomes an issue you know, and that just like blew my mind because it never took away from anything. It was just something that was happening yeah. that they were talking about. And I just thought that was cool. Yeah. I thought the the guards were pretty shit. You would imagine they'd have a lot of practice of dealing with people like this, and it seemed that they were taken care of rather too easily, um, for my liking, in a lot of scenes. Um, you know, it didn't seem realistic that people who work full time dealing with people like this could be so easily taken out uh, at certain key points of the movie um, and so easily misled. I mean, come on, <laughs> you work in a prison, you know what the fucking score is like. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, I, I don't know. Maybe it's true, but it didn't ring true for me. Was the the amount of dangerous things that were lying around the place, like pool cues and snooker balls and um, washing basins with sharp corners and stuff like this. You know? <laughs> this that, that was on a different level, though. Like, it seemed there was very much a hierarchy of when they clear prisoners, or what it seemed like was when a prisoner has something over on people, yeah. they get this shit, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, what's your take on the amount of dangerous things that are just li- left around for dangerous people to get a hold of. I kind of just was fine with it given the level of genius violence in the movie. <laughs> Absolutely like making violence from something that I never would have thought about. Like uh, a radio antenna. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if that's going to be a dangerous thing, right? At a certain point then Jesus, you know, they're going to find a way. Yeah. I think that they, they encounter that from the beginning of the movie and everything after that I'm like, no, nah, there'll they'll be fucking violence. Yeah, if you yeah. want a chair to exist, there's well, like going to be violence. A toothbrush, yeah, you know. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I suppose it's just because you see a lot of the American prison TV shows and, you know, they have the furniture molded into the wall. Yeah. <laughs> you to pick it up. <laughs> yeah. there, there, there's fucking light years ahead in terms of, you know, prison officer safety. <laughs> but then again, they're private prisons, aren't they? Mm, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, you get what you pay for. <laughs> Different budgets, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also, I found some of the violence a little bit fake looking. <laughs> it wasn't real enough, was it? <laughs> there, there was really? A, yeah. Really? There, there was a couple of well, encounters. I don't, don't want to yeah. spoil yeah, yeah, the movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. but there was a couple of encounters that looked just not real. Mm. Um Probably because one of the parties involved wasn't physically capable of doing the stunts required to make it look real. Um, and that kind of took from it a little bit because it, it jarred me. I said, that's bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but maybe that's just me. Yeah, I like better quality violence. Better quality <laughs> violence. <laughs> what? So mark down there on the quality st- uh, yeah. violence stakes anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything else on this? Yeah, um, I couldn't. <laughs> Sorry, I've been really fucking negative. No, come on, <laughs> <laughs> go on, Mike. We missed you. We I missed th- you, man. <laughs> I think the biggest problem with the movie is that you can't root for the protagonist because he's just such a fucking little shit of a human being. Mm. Um, like any time that uh, he was the object of the violence, I was kind of saying, "Go on, get in there, fucking finish the little rabbit." Bastard off, you know. It's funny because I got behind him after I saw what his dad was like, uh-huh. and then I realized, ah, yeah. not his fault. <laughs> ah, that's a fucking cop up. No, uh, I, I was, was behind him immediately. Him. What? what? Hmm? I was behind him fucking immediately. Ooh. The second he made a mistake and was genuinely sorry about it, but he didn't know what else to like. There was nothing else for him to do, you know. Like, the scene that you were talking about with him running back, he's done something and he knows he's about to get back to shit. Yeah. I was completely... He was like... He tries very briefly. Yeah. Like, he goes, maybe they'll let me off. Like, yeah. maybe this is something I can get away with. Because mm. I didn't fucking mean it. Like, And yeah. if I don't mean it, surely that should mean something. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't fucking matter. Mm. I was behind him immediately. And when he gets ready for that shit, I'm just like, this is his life. Mm. It doesn't matter. Anything that he tries. Mm. He's done a lot of vicious fucking shit. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. 
But anything he tries, I think, it ends up like this. At least that's what he has in his head. And I was behind him straight away. I think sometimes, like, good stories, though, some sophisticated stories are told really well when you're kind of forced to root for protagonist who you know is an asshole. Yeah. We discussed while you were gone, Mike, about my inability to like unlikable people, <laughs> as seen in some of the TV shows we were yeah. reviewing. Um, but I've thought about that because I, I'm really into House of Cards right now, and like, Kevin Spacey's character is abhorrible, but yet I'm kind of rooting for him. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, like, there's there's kind of no win situation. Either he kind of gets what he wants, and <laughs> like to the detriment of I don't know who. But um, Go on, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you want the protagonist to win, even when you kind of know they're not great people. I, w- I wonder if this is that that. So what case. I'm hearing is, as, as a result of taking part in this show, you've given up all your moral standards. Yes, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't take long. Right, let's mark this. John. Easy. Eight. Right. It's an eight. Yeah. This movie's fucking class. Mike. Um, I'm going to have to give this a six. I can't go higher than that. Okay. Um, I'm going to give this an eight as well. It was very nearly a nine, but I'm going to give this an eight. Really love this. It's great. Um, it's quite violent. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think uh, it's all in context. You wouldn't, you wouldn't bring your kids to see it, really, would you? No. <laughs> no I don't think it's advertised that way, Mike. <laughs> what was that, John? Unless you wanted to scare them fucking straight. <laughs> They'd have no problem. They're about to hear the word cunt a thousand times and watch people get shivved to fucking death. Don't do bad things. Uh, next up is uh, First of Our TV, which is Intruders. Uh, this stars John Sim um, and Mira Sorvino as his wife. And James Frain. Did you remember James? I was trying to remember where I saw James Frain from. Of course, I've seen him in everything because he's been in everything. But mm-hmm. uh, I remember him, I think, from Tron Legacy and mm-hmm. uh, True Blood. True Blood was I what I was going to say. I believe he's in Grimm yeah. as well, but I don't. I, it wasn't from that I remember. But uh, this is about a uh, body snatching secret society who are seeking immortality, <laughs> and they seem to start with kids. Or <laughs> 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 so <laughs> let's, possess, let, let's possess kids. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's that's what it's about, really. It's a body oh, snatching. think of the children. Yeah, the body <laughs> snatching program is series. Body snatching in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Uh, John Sim, we saw uh, last year in, or maybe it was early earlier this year in Prey, that miniserie, um, which was quite good, um, and he's quite good in this as well. Um, wasn't too gone on the storyline on this. No. No. Why did? Too slow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah, what that you guys think? I think the first episode, it's kind of hard to tell exactly where it's going. Like, I was interested yeah. to hear your synopsis of what the show was about because I'm still not entirely clear after seeing the episode. Yeah. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's kind of t- while I was watching it, it really reminded me of um, a French zombie TV show called uh, Les Revenants. It's on Netflix. The Returned. Yes, the return. <laughs> yeah. Steve loved the shit out of that. Yeah, that was it. it was so yeah. good, wasn't yeah, yeah, it? Yeah, it was great. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and this reminded me a lot of that in terms of like there was a lot of space in its direction. You know, there's there's kind of a lot of silence and looks and the even the color filtering is very kind of blue hazy. Um, there's always kind of a tension. It's very. I I just mm. thought it was uh it, it just it's while I was watching it immediately uh. The returned, I suppose I should use the English term, um, came to mind. But uh, it's not really clear what the, what the show's about. You know that there's some kind of body snatching going on, but you don't know much more than that. Who's body snatching and what do these cards mean that all these these people are being served up uh, cards? And then you know that there's a bit of a struggle. Um, I, th- I assume the struggle is the host kind of struggling against the body snatcher. Uh, th- I think you kind of need to see more it's to really a, yeah. understand what's happening, but that might be part of what's yeah. good about it. You know that it's it's subtle that way. It's not like after five minutes, like uh, Mister Pickles, you, you know exactly what you're watching. <laughs> like <laughs> this, Don't this you be Mr. Pickles. <laughs> that works on a lot of different levels. <laughs> I thought those cards were kind of funny. Nine. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make a, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Know, okay. Yeah, go with that. Yeah. I, I thought that was just the that was the period of time, right? Nine years. 
nine years. Like as in a body snatcher inhabits a body for nine years and then it moves on. And then they get, and then they get murdered, I believe. And then they move to either another body or else they have to pay a fee to move to the next body. I was, I was thinking he's like a collector or some shit. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, I thought the well, nine was a ticket for valet parking or something. <laughs> <laughs> Their hotel room it. key. <laughs> Your body's over here, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it had the coolest gun mm. uh, I've seen in a series in ages. Um, James, James Frain, uh, mm. he had this cool gun. It was a, a pistol. I'm not usually into or noticing guns that often, but this one is pretty cool. It was a nine millimeter double barrel side by side. Um, in fact, I looked it up. It's an AF twenty eleven A one second century double barrel pistol. Yeah, no. I know that gun. Banana. It's my personal favorite. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're on YouTube. They pack a punch. Yeah, no, they we just, should do they look a plug like... right now and see if we can get some free ones. <laughs> no, they're fantastic. They look like jewelry. Yeah. Anyway, that's why I noticed it. Anyway. Yeah, but, if we yeah. grew up in Texas, we'd probably get that for our sixth birthday or something. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you have it for your quinceanera? You know. <laughs> um, I saw this show, Steve. It reminds me of all the bad parts of otherwise good shows clumped together into one, like uh, the leftovers. Yeah. The bad parts of that show is like I don't really. The way they're trying to make us interested in this particular thing seems heavy-handed. And I don't give a shit. And then things like uh, like Lost. If there was ever an episode where you're just like, no, you're not telling me like anything, and your attempts to intrigue me continue to annoy. Like that seemed to just happen a lot in a row. Every now and then, I'd almost get inter- interested in something. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, that person's acting in a weird way. Oh yeah, of course, because the person that used to be in her body isn't in anymore. That makes sense. Fine. Well, now what's going to happen? Oh, just more of that for yeah. 35 minutes. Good. Fine. I'm with you on that. And uh, like Mike said at the start there, slow and then, it, it, yeah, it was like, move on. We get that. Move on. Yeah, you need a bit more to chew yeah, on. And uh, I just lost interest. Um, and then I was away looking at the clock, waiting for it to finish. You know. What changes? What changes from the first scene, once that's over, to the last one? All it is is repetition with three other characters. Yeah. 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 See, the first scene was a great introduction. You're like, oh, yeah, what's what's going to happen now? Mm. And then a lot of the same things. See, I was really intrigued um, even seeing that happen to various characters. But then once, I think, uh, once you kind of see what your man in black just started doing and then the end of the yeah. episode just started kind of unraveling in a way that was just like, oh, okay, this isn't quite as interesting it's kind of going more one way when i thought it was going to kind of yeah. start showing us a bit more of a mystery or become a bit more intriguing or explain the complexities but instead it's just like oh no there's... yeah that's it they seem to be having a lot of conversations about stuff they haven't told us about yeah so it's just like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> next they, they almost had it <laughs> what did you think about that uh the young uh child actress M- maddie madison the girl playing the, girl that lives the, on the seaside? man. The girl. The girl. The girl who got the number nine card, who the apparently is named Marcus. Weren't there a few that got the number nine card? Like, because the opening scene, that the, person. The got youngest one by the beach. Yeah, the one that lives by the beach. The, like child. <laughs> yeah. Don't shoot me. I um. <laughs> I'm too pretty. There, to die. <laughs> there was a scene with the bath that um I had to I just had to uh yeah. I did take exception. That's yeah, I thought Mike wouldn't like that. Mm, no, yeah. 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 I thought you'd like that. Though, it, was, it was as of that <laughs> scene. <laughs> you know me so well. Yeah. Uh, it was as of that scene that I decided, like, this show is going in a way that I'm just not interested in. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought that was kind of al- almost going towards horror, like yeah. the horror of possession, yeah. which maybe is a better way for them to go than just, I'm going to be in your body unless I get shot. And then her crying, I bought. I was like, holy shit. Like that, fair enough. She can cry on command. Good, like good job. But then every other thing she said in a grown-up way, particularly in the preview for the second episode, which is already out, I just wasn't buying it. I was just like, don't try and talk like a grown-up. You're ten years old. Yeah. This is not something I want to watch ever. You're wearing a yellow raincoat and a red backpack. <laughs> we can only take you so seriously. <laughs> we know what you're trying to do, people in the TV show. It's not working. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know what's wrong with you people. I thought it was great. Did you, you? going to watch more of this, Mike? Of 
course, yeah. Well, let us know how you Did get you on. Did you think it was more realistic than Stared Up? Was it just that the level of violence in their interactions was more realistic? <laughs> than it was, right. was the violence of a better grade, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's got supernatural, and it's got you know evil kids. I'm sure there'll be a clown at some stage. <laughs> you know, what's not to like? One of these days, somebody is going to get this type of show right. And it's not today, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Give him another episode. Give him another episode. Yeah, I live in hope. Okay. <laughs> Straight up, it's from filler, filler for me. Fuck's sake. You've just no imagination. That's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to give it Thriller because I want to see more to see yeah, which yeah. direction oh. it goes towards. Oh, okay. Yeah. That seems like a pity thriller. No, it's <laughs> it's not. No. No. It sounds like a, bake, a breakup thriller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just going to throw up the show one. One no, more. It reminded me enough of Les Revenants that I thought there might be hope here. So I'd watch it again just to see if, uh, if it kind of goes closer to the tone of the first half of the episode rather than following the, the path that seems to be on, which is the kind of horror genre on the second half of the episode. So I'll go, I'll go thriller. I'll, I'll watch another episode. If we applied that principle to dating, that would be shocking. <laughs> you remind me of a boyfriend that was good, and even though this date is terrible, you know, fuck it. For nostalgia's sake, let's see if you aren't shit. Let's just give it a go. So it's a uh, trailer from you? Yeah. Mike? There's a cop. He's pretty good at investigating. He's got a history. You know? <laughs> and there's, You're there's in. some supernatural things he's got to deal with. And you know, a college buddy who just shows up out of nowhere. <laughs> wow, I wonder if that's important. <laughs> <laughs> damn, damn right I'm going to watch more of this. It's a thriller for me. <laughs> Sean? Uh, yeah, based on how bad it is, I'm not going to watch anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Zing! So it is campus split here. Okay, right. Um, oh, big news happened to me this week. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, a famous UNLV alum, uh, Anthony Zucker, uh, you may have heard of him. He invented all of the CSI things. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, he was very kind uh, to call us for over an hour, actually, to call the fiction workshop that I'm in and just talk to us about the craft of screenwriting and writing in general uh, so, and a little bit about his projects. So I thought I'd just give, give you guys a little bit of, of what he, uh, he said to us. Mm -hmm. First of all, the guy writes for three hours every day, like in the mornings when he wakes up, okay. even if he has to spend 12 days working on set. Like he started talking to us about his schedule. It's ridiculous. The amount of projects that he has gone at various different times is crazy. Um, and his newest of which is uh, called CSI Cyber. It was a show that will be coming out uh, probably mid-season, uh, mid-season debuting on CBS. It stars James Vanderbeek. Oh, yeah. which everybody knows, and Pat Patricia Arquette is the lead. Oh, right. Uh, and it's about crimes that uh, begin in cyberspace but make their way into the real world. <laughs> so it's very different to the forensic uh, idea that he essentially popularized with, the, with CSI, which was one of the biggest deals ever in the realm of whodunit and mystery and has been imitated so many times uh, across all of the other networks. Um, so cyber seems like something a little bit different. And what's interesting about it is that he's actually done a lot of work with uh, multimedia uh, writing and entertainment. Uh, what was interesting was my dad actually showed me something to do with this uh, years ago because he was actually reading it. There's this book, or well, a series of books called Level 26. Um, and you buy the book, you read it, and I believe each of the murder scenes uh, that they're, you know, as they're discovering evidence, once they discover enough, there's this little code that you type into a website and it shows you a filmed scene. Uh, yeah. And Dad showed me one of these before. It's of this guy, Squeagle, who's uh, apparently forensic proof. Like he wears this completely, like covers every inch of his body suit, like and he just kind of slips through openings you'd never believe a person would get through to murder people. Like a, a very like sexual uh, and very deviant at the same time. So that was really cool. I didn't even know that that was him, uh, but he's been doing that for ages, and Squeagle even guest starred on CSI at one point, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. And he's written bestsellers, you know, and I believe he's even working on a book now with his son um, uh, to do with autism, which is very interesting. 
so yeah, he just kind of talked to us a lot about his projects and he was very generous just to talk about his methods and stuff and a lot of really heart wrenching stories. Like the main thread of what he said to us was that every line that he writes that works, he can pinpoint the part of his life or the moment in his life that it comes from. Oh, wow. Which I thought was, it was crazy and he was so open about it. He would literally just, he told us a couple of stories about what he was doing. He's also got some animation stuff that'll be coming out as well. Um, and he told us some of the stories from that. And then he just went, so that's from this moment in my life, you know, from my early childhood. Uh, he said that the, the reason, the, the, one of the biggest reasons why he's a writer is because one of the first things he ever got a big fat red A on was just uh, about a mountain of Rocky Road ice cream. You know, <laughs> like he just did this one pager thing when he was a kid. And it was the first thing I went like, good job. That was great. And he went, that's what I'm going to do now. <laughs> and that's kind of what he like strives for. The idea of that pat on the back cool. um, at all times. Uh, but yeah, it was really interesting. And I think he's going to talk to us again, uh, which is awesome talking about the politics of writing and just talking about uh, screenwriting in very particular, like TV writing, how to craft the pitch and the log line, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So great guy, very indebted to him, uh, both myself and all my classmates. Very Anthony cool. Zucker. Yeah. Cool. So uh, was he in attendance or Skyping? Or? He was actually, it was his wife's birthday week. So he was on a beach in Carmel. <laughs> uh, he was on a beach in Carmel on day seven, I believe. Uh, on the phone, walking, he didn't stop moving the entire conversation, uh, walking up and down this, uh, apparently quite beautiful beach, uh, while his wife was away doing something else and they were going to reunite, uh, for horse riding. They were going to have a horse ride along the beach to cap off the birthday week. So anyway, nice. that, that was a, even a bigger deal, you know, that he found the time to do that. He called us at 4 p.m. on the dot. Like, amazing. Cool. Yeah. Good. Very good. Um, okay. Let's talk about second of our movies, which is What If. Shona. What If is a romantic comedy starring Daniel Radcliffe um, as a Brit living in America who meets and falls in love with a girl who has a boyfriend. Mm. Short and sweet. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a rom-com, so there's not going to be a lot of layers of death to it. So uh, but it's the first time we've really seen um, Daniel Radcliffe in this type of film. He's done, after Harry Potter, he's gone on to do, I think, really good scripts in various genres. You know, he did that black, what was it called? Woman in Black. Woman in Black, yeah, yeah. that was got rave reviews. Yeah, he, and from this very podcast. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, fair play. Absolutely love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I never saw it, it, it looked scary. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> No, it's brilliant. I've heard it's amazing. Yeah, yeah it's really good. Um, so yeah, now we get to see him in a rom-com, which is, I think, mm-hmm. almost like the last genre he's tried. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably didn't want to get too too stuck in being, um, I suppose, a heartthrob. He's known as being like the nicest guy ever, so I kind of just want him to do well in whatever he does. Right. Um, it's he's got funny. a lot of fans here, actually. As yes. in, he bumped like into in some dudes room on Grafton Street one night. And oh, really? He's like, come back to the house and have a bit of crack. And he was like, okay. He was filming uh, in town at the he time. He just and sounds and, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. Like the, the movie is based in Toronto, where I grew up. And it's kind of also based in Ireland, where I moved it's to. Toronto in America now, yeah. Oh, did I call it an American? <laughs> Ooh. Rewind. <laughs> Let's edit this out. Canadian. <laughs> For the record, listeners, uh, Steve and Mike just high fived in front of my face. <laughs> Damn it. I was going to let it slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's go back. So, what if it's a film based in Toronto about a Brit, uh, Daniel Radcliffe? Um, so, yeah, it's kind of got an indie feel to the film, uh, which I guess is fairly hard to do um, because it's starring Daniel Radcliffe. It's also another film that exploits the hipsters of Toronto mm. uh, because there really is so many of them. <laughs> are they like scene kids? Yeah, they're scene stars, total scene stars. Yeah, mm. they all have like white ties and matching white belts and then like Converse shoes. Oh, God. There's a, there's a strict <laughs> uniform. Really? Yeah. Uh. 
At least they're not pulling their <laughs> white socks up over their tracks with bottoms. <laughs> Do you know I have a school picture in grade six where I did that? I, I don't know that. why. That day I thought it was super cool. Let me just paint this picture, and I know we're on a tangent, but it's totally worth it. Everybody <laughs> close your eyes, and I want you to picture my sartorial choices from when I was like nine. So we start with a pair of black patent leather loafers, some white uh, sports socks, tube socks, pulled up full height to my knee level over my like MC Hammer style jeans, white blouse tucked into it. My long like uh, hair was crimped only in the middle because I thought that looked way cooler. <laughs> and I have two huge buck teeth. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome, everybody. <laughs> Speechless. Speechless. <laughs> anyway, so back to this film. Uh, so that's why you left the country. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> I was actually shamed out of the country. <laughs> Somebody got a picture. <laughs> Passport withdrawn. <laughs> There's a reason I work in audio-only channels. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, so we see Daniel Radcliffe falling in love with this kind of like awkward girl and they end up having a lot in common. And then she says, you know, kind of at the first night when they meet, he's obviously brokenhearted over his ex dumping him. And uh, they end up having a good night. I mean, a kind of an awkward good night like you would have when you meet a stranger at a party that you kind of hit it off with, but they're still a stranger. Mm -hmm. um, and they both and they both find each other sneaking out of the party, trying to sneak out without saying goodbye to the other person. So they kind of laugh at that. They walk home together. And then she kind of drops the bomb like, oh, I should uh, tell my boyfriend that I had a great night. And then she kind of scurries inside. And they end up agreeing that, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll be friends. That's fine. Um, and Daniel Radcliffe kind of starts going around telling his friends, you know, well, just because she's a girl, it doesn't mean that we can't be friends. And um, he's kind of challenging people to uh, to tell him it's not possible. And um, But, of course, he is secretly harboring emotion for her. And... Uh, yeah, she's dating a great guy who works for the UN as the copyright expert. And he's a technical writer, which is also the other job I do when I'm not in the Is It a Bicycle Studios. So basically this film made fun of every major life choice I've ever made. Is, is the boyfriend played by Adam Driver? Uh, who is that? Oh, no, no, no. That's not the guy from Girls. No, he is the he is the connection between Daniel Radcliffe and the girl. He's the girl's wow. cousin and Daniel Radcliffe's best friend. Is he funny in this? He's he the same to... character he plays in Girls, oh, okay. in my opinion. Okay. Like really highly sexualized, kind of uh, spontaneous, so but funny. like hidden wisdom. I don't know if it's funny. <laughs> is that funny? Hilarious in Girls, anyway. <laughs> Sex <laughs> isn't funny, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe not the way you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I think just spur oh, he spurted beer out of his mouth. Oh, that's fast. Did that come out your nose, that's Mike? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord! And you low. <laughs> uh, people across the country are spitting their coffee onto their computer screens right now. <laughs> it's, it's good to know that we can always say that C Steve's. Uh, Sexual style calls Mike <laughs> to travel all over himself. So, Mike. Um, first off, I have to. <laughs> you need to recover. You need to recover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just take a deep breath, Mike. I have to say that this movie caused me some considerable emotional problems because I went up to the cinema. Last night, uh, a middle-aged man on his own <laughs> on a Tuesday night to watch a romantic comedy <laughs> with all the couples in the queue going in. <laughs> I felt a little uncomfortable, <laughs> but I just said, I'm doing it. Just doing the job, man. <laughs> You're gonna have to wear like a press badge. Yeah, I you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. It could be my generic excuse. Yes, I'm going to see this because yeah. I have to. <laughs> or your is it a bicycle T-shirt? Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I did like the trailer, which we we looked at a few a few weeks ago. Um, so I had reasonable expectations for it. I went in and. I found that I really, really liked the supporting cast. Um, like the buddy, what was his name? Adam Driver. Adam Driver. Yeah. I thought he was fucking hilarious. 
<laughs> we just have to look at that guy nowadays. <laughs> yeah. you know, just with, like, with his uh, sexualized wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought um, the sister was brilliant. Yeah. Um, and I thought that Daniel Radcliffe's ex-girlfriend, she, she only has, I think, one scene, but she totally steals that scene. Yeah. Um, I, I thought they actually could have made more of her. Um, and uh, the boyfriend, I mm-hmm. thought he was really good as well. Mm-hmm. The major issue I had with it was the, 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 the chemistry between the two didn't work for me. Um, they had the, all this cute banter, and I was sitting there listening to it and thinking, wow, somebody has worked for fucking weeks to put that together. And it sounds like somebody has worked for fucking weeks <laughs> to put that together. I, I just didn't believe it. It was too cutesy. The banality of the conversation kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It was. It, it just didn't ring true for me. Mm. And and strangely enough, when when the two were in different scenes, like on their own, mm-hmm. I thought both of the actors did really, really well. Um, I really enjoyed what they were doing. But once they got together, I was kind of, Ah, no, just stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, maybe that's just me. Did you feel that? or I did, but that's because, t- to me, their conversation, I mean, it, it, it all comes down to the um, the girlfriend. I should really remember her name. Uh, Ch- Chantry, that's mm. it. Um, Chantry works in an animation loft in Toronto mm. and works yeah. with a lot of very arty people. Mm. And their conversations, like I've gone to so many parties and and listened to conversations like that and wanted to stab myself every time. <laughs> so there is an issue I have. Wow, self harm. That is an issue. <laughs> <laughs> no, I told you that my my ex is a musician and he is the genre of musician from Toronto, and I, I, I can blame I can blame his <laughs> circle of friends for being a terrible company. Um, so I've heard. It's, it sounded fake, but I've heard real conversations that sound that forced, mm-hmm. you know. So in some ways, the awkwardness, I suppose, was real. But I think you're dead on and that the chemistry wasn't there. Mm. Like, what was that movie we watched recently with uh, Kira Knightley and your man Ruffalo? Begin Again. Begin Again. Like, there, there was a smoldering chemistry between the two. And they didn't really need a whole lot of dialogue to get that across. Mm. But here was a blah, 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 blah. And... I just didn't feel it between them. Really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you had to keep one, either Chantry or Daniel Radcliffe, who would you keep? Who would I keep? Yeah. Like, down, if, in a down dungeon? Down in my basement, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Change the well, world if, with Well, if it. you'd like, <laughs> Mike, I meant, I meant more in the film. <laughs> who would you keep in the film and which one would you replace? Um, I would have kept Daniel Radcliffe. Um, I thought Chantry was a little bit too weak as yeah. a character. Yeah, I think I agree. Uh, she's, she really doesn't know what the fuck she wants, you know, yeah. in fairness. Yeah. Um, Daniel Radcliffe, he knows what he wants, he just doesn't have the balls to go and get it. Yeah. Um, He'll have a couple of horns to help him, though, in the next room. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, part, part of this is in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, just uh, saw there is some of it was filmed in Trinity and in the Stag's Head. Yes. Yeah. And uh, when when it first came up, I, I didn't realize there was there was an Irish element to it. But uh, yeah. when it first came up to it, uh, you see uh, Chantry's boyfriend standing um, kind of just off O'Connell Bridge, mm-hmm. and you can see the harp there in the background. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ah, the harp. <laughs> but I was I was kind of looking at the, the the focus of the picture to think, okay, is is he actually there, or have they just put a picture in behind? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Green screen. Yeah, yeah but uh, then later on, it's, it's quite obvious they did actually send a camera crew over there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I was quite impressed. They got all the, the scobes and junkies off of Connell Street. For a shot. Maybe that was the, the time that he met those guys. Uh, during I would say this. Yeah, yeah, makes possible, sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Like when he met the people who just won the Sam Maguire or whatever it was. Yeah, uh, it, was, uh, a, uh, it was a junior team anyway. It won a large... Some team. championship. Yeah, because yeah. there's a great picture of Daniel Radcliffe off his head, twatted drunk. Like he can't really open his eyes or focus them. 
just holding this big Irish championship thing over his head. Just kind of going, oh, I have to be at work in an hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So I just missed his chance to actually have started the Ice Bucket Challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, anything else on this? Not really. No. I think uh, it was a good film. I, th- I think if you're kind of looking for something to go kill uh, time with, you want to. Because you know how sometimes you want to go to the cinema and you don't care so much about what you see? Yeah. I don't know. I have days like that. Yeah. So I think this film's probably a good contender for one of those days. It's not going to win any Oscars, but these films don't really do that. So yeah. is it, you know, mm. it, it, it does what it says on the tin. Okay. And what mark would you give it? Um. Oh, see, I'm torn between a six or a seven. Mm-hmm. I'll give it a seven because it, I mean, it is what it is. And I guess it's, it's, it's an okay rom-com. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mike. Um, yeah, as I said, like, the, the main thrust of it, I didn't really buy. But I thought all the rest of it around that thrust <laughs> was so good. I'm, I'm going to give it a six. <laughs> um, even though I'm a little disappointed because I thought the trailer had a lot more potential than what actually mm. was yeah. on screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The best bits. That's it. In the trailer. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, no, no. There's a couple uh, of really good bits. Not okay. in the trailer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there you go. Um. Okay. Very good. Um. Now the last of our TV, which is uh, BoJack Horseman, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this, Mike. BoJack Horseman is a washed up TV star who was in a 1980s TV program about a horse who adopted three human children (laughs) and uh, had a sitcom relationship and now uh, he's unemployed virtually forgotten um, except at parties where everybody's oh you were the horse from that show yeah (laughs) the show horsing around (laughs) (laughs) do do you think that was based on different strokes Quite possibly, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it's a cartoon um, about a cartoon and a horse that was in a cartoon and is also in a cartoon, and um, yeah, it goes from there. Do you know who did his voice? Oh, yeah. Will Arnett. Oh, I do. Yeah, Will Arnett and Aaron Paul and Amy Sedaris. That's right. Hilarious, hilarious, and hilarious. Mm-hmm. But does it work? Tell us, does it? Well, you tell me, Steve. Does it? Someone tell someone something. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is this an I'll show you mine if you're sure. Me <laughs> <laughs> I went into Comedy it with a bit wise. of trepidation. Mm. Mm-hmm. Because it's it probably so Mr. Pickles. Well. Have you have you been scarred yeah, a bit from yeah, yeah, like yeah, animated? So. Mr. Pickles did it the week before, yeah. <laughs> um, granted, I watched three episodes of that before I made my mind up. <laughs> <laughs> did you really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Two and a half, anyway. But, um, uh, but uh, yeah, this wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It uh, mm. doesn't mean I'll watch it again or any more of it. But mm. uh, yeah, I found it entertaining. Um, he was a little bit too moany. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, over silly things. Uh, but I did like his uh, his whole uh, living in the past side. Mm-hmm. Um, still, like he watches reruns every day yeah, of the show he was on. Uh-huh. Of his glory days and. Uh, all his puns about being a horse, uh, mm. that kind of thing, because it really fit into the stereotypical 80s sitcom. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it could have been a show had it, had it been a different universe, mm. you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's, fu- it's quite funny in mm. places, all right, yeah. Mm. yeah. Come back to me. What did everyone else <laughs> think? I didn't like it at all. Did no. you not? No. Um, I suppose I've been spoiled, like, with... Mr. Pickles and oh, shut Mr. Up. <laughs> yeah. Archer and Buckleberry and yeah. South Park, you know. You see, you, it, there, there, you've set the bar right there. Yeah. Once you mention Archer, mm-hmm. we're we're talking about adult <clears throat> animation here. Yeah. And if you're setting the bar that high, mm-hmm. there's very little. Yeah, I. I, wasn't I think offend- you're right, though. I, I wasn't right. offended at all at any <laughs> station. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's not really offensive, is it? No. Oh. Uh, like if if I'm yeah. going to enjoy a cartoon like this, I really have to have that moment where I go. <laughs> can't believe you said that. <laughs> I didn't find that here. Mm. I thought that the most interesting part of it was everything that wasn't to do with the setup. You know, because obviously they have to do that bullshit. Pilots are terrible setup thing. Yeah. 
But whenever they like, they have this great joke with Aaron Paul's character. Mm-hmm. He spends the first half of the episode just being a guy who crashes on his couch. He's kind of fed up, like a complete cliche character. And then it, there's just a great moment where they do a, a cutaway to a really tense situation yeah. that's way more adult than like anything else that had been in the show previously. And then it just that just happens kind of in the background, and all those little hints are really hilarious. I think. Uh, and I think that every episode after this, because it doesn't have to do that work, legitimately will just have room for jokes. Because I know they can write jokes that are funny, because they did that every time they weren't trying to set up shit. Mm. So I thought that was cool. Point, yeah. And I did like the ending. I liked the way that the ending worked, uh, not just because uh, they showed that they can they can do the weird family guy thing of keep saying a thing over and over until it's funny again. I, I, I appreciated that and liked it. Not sure how it's going to go beyond a series of flashbacks to Bojack Horseman's life that while he's writing this memoir with this ghostwriter type person. So, yeah, I'm not really sure what to expect from the next few episodes, but I'm hoping we get a lot more of uh, the side characters and, and the weird stuff. Mm. And it's on Netflix, so it's prime for uh, binge watching. Mm-hmm. I think so. I had um, high hopes because I like Will Arnett. Um and I also like Amy Sedaris. And, uh, you know, Aaron Paul's had his moments. So I thought, <laughs> I hope this is good. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think more or less it, it kind of, I found it deflated. Um, it wasn't that funny. I think in the vein of kind of adult themed animation, I always think of South Park, but I think Archer's probably a better example. <laughs> right, um, yeah. I think it was, it's, it's, it's one in a long line of, of shows that I think are trying to follow in those footsteps and it, it definitely falls short, but I'm hoping that the show maybe finds its feet. I might give it another shot just because I have a Netflix subscription. I'm, I'm probably going to flick it on one day and just see if it's any good um, and try it again. And that's kind of like the danger and probably also the benefit of Netflix is because shows that you maybe wouldn't give another chance if you had to wait a week to see it. But once it's kind of there in front of you and you've got half an hour to kill, you might think, yeah, I'll try. I'll try another one. But um, I think as as who writes the show? Does anyone know? I don't know who writes it, but I know it's executive produced by Aaron Paul as well. Apparently, he put the money up for the or part of the money up. For the okay, because I was going to think I, I, although Aaron Paul and Will Arnett are both very funny, and so is Amy Sedaris. I I don't know if. Arnett or Aaron Paul have um, have proven themselves kind of as as lead humorists, you know. Like, I think Will Arnett is kind of classically awesomest as Job in in Arrested Development. He's kind of a great, um, you know, sidekick. But I I don't I'm I'm still holding my breath to see if he can pull off being a leading man. Um, I'm not sure. It's a certain style of comedy as well, isn't it? Yeah. Of, of humor, yeah. very wry, very mm. sort of mm. kind of flat. I, mm-hmm. I felt uh, I was expecting mm-hmm. I don't know something a bit more Archer esque or or even Harvey a bit, a bit Har- punchier uh, Harvey Birdman even yeah. you know just I, I think it'd be a lot I think that f- it was sorry go ahead Sean I think it was oper- I was just gonna say it was operating as a Will Ferrell movie character mm-hmm. but it's animation like very much the guy who's up his own hole but is absolutely an idiot yeah you know like completely yeah. that and also Will Arnett has kind of played a similar character before he had uh, Mitchell Hurwitz did a a sitcom after, or I guess between Arrested Developments, um, called Re- uh, Re- Running Wild, W-I-L-D-E, where he played this billionaire who had no idea about the world, uh, and Kerry Russell was this activist who, uh, you know, tried to redeem him and also didn't know what she was doing in her relationship. And he plays a similar character in that, and I think he might do it better, or maybe the writing was just stronger. And that got cancelled, so who knows yeah. what's going to happen. I remember he was in a sitcom with Christina Applegate about they were being new parents, and she worked mm. as a producer for a TV show, and he was a stay-at-home dad. And that show I thought was really good. You know, he his character there kind of balanced being kind of the straight man with being funny. Like, he and Christina Applegate desperately want to be cool to their young, cool neighbors, but they've got this kid at home, and I don't know, hilarity ensues. Oh, yeah, I um, remember that. Too. Yeah, it was, I had yeah, to hold it down, we though. Reviewed I don't think it. it did very well. We reviewed it. It ran for two seasons, and it got cancelled. Uh, I didn't like any part of it that didn't involve Will Arnett. Yeah. Which yeah. is more of a compliment, to yeah, be honest. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I think if you were one of the couple of dozen of people who were big stars of uh, popular shows in the 80s, 
and you weren't famous anymore, you'd find it fucking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's a very narrow demographic. <laughs> All of the Cosbys except for the dad. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so, trailer filler, John? Um, I think I'm going to watch another episode, and I, I'm about 50-50 on it, but I'm definitely going to watch one and see, so thriller from me. Okay. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it again just to kind of see if it proves me wrong. But I don't have very high hopes. So I'm gonna give another wishy washy uh, thriller that Sean can get mad at me for. Okay. <laughs> Fuck this shit. Thriller. <laughs> thriller. <laughs> yeah, it's a thriller for me as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So next up, we've got some previews in coming to a bicycle near you. So the first one is Automata. And automata. Automata, Automata. The that's first awesome. rule of automata. Fight Club is... <laughs> that's what this kind of reminded me of. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> There's rules and regulations mm. to having robots, it, is, it appears. Another mm-hmm. goddamn AI movie. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. to watch, like. What did it, you think of this, it, though? This it didn't one. go with Isaac Asimov's Three Laws, which I found interesting. Yeah. So Isaac Asimov's Three Laws, the first one they have is similar, but they call it a protocol, like it can't allow harm to come to any human or do harm to a human. And that's, you know what, you guys should just start putting that into your code for everything now. I'd appreciate it. (laughs) And then the second one seems to be the core of the movie, and it's that one's different. It's robots cannot be, like, alter themselves. Yeah. Which seems to be there's a bunch of robots who want to and want to try to. Uh, And Antonio Banderas... It's just like, don't do that. I'm very serious in this movie, and I'm going to be class. And then Dylan McDermott's like, I'm going to kill a load of robots, and I look badass right now. And the robots are like, nah, don't. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty much it. There's kind of a Blade Runner-y kind of theme. There is a bit of a theme to it, isn't it? If Harrison Ford was in this... Cool. Yeah, and it was raining a lot yeah. more. Yeah, 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 yeah. And lots of Chinese dudes with noodles around. It. <laughs> <laughs> Steam rising from yeah. stuff. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, um, we're going to watch this, Shona. I don't know. You know, it's dystopian future sci-fi, which is my shiz. So I probably will. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. is it? Did they say twenty forty? Twenty forty four. Twenty forty four. Yeah. It's a grown up iRobot. <laughs> It's a grown-up by robot. I'm looking yeah. forward to this a lot. Yeah. Uh, the next one was uh, the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, <laughs> Sponge Out of Water. <laughs> Mike. Fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> no, just no. No, Jonah. Uh, I don't know. I, it looks like fun. SpongeBob comes to life. Mm. <laughs> John. So, so there's this book, and it's if you get it, and anything you write, and it comes true, and Antonio Banderas wants it, and SpongeBob's like, no. Yeah, and I think that kids will like this because duh, SpongeBob, and I think it's a little funnier than the average kids thing. But I think the animation quality is going to be lost on them. This looks almost weird, like the uncanny valley. We're right in the middle of <laughs> seeing it in three D. Might just I don't know. I might vomit. I might think it's class. Yeah, I think this definitely has potential for being excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we've already seen the best part of the movie, which is when SpongeBob gets. Kicked <laughs> into orbit. Yeah. <laughs> Have you watched any of the animation series? Unfortunately, uh, when my offspring was young, I was forced to watch many, many, many episodes. Many of, of yeah. Spongebob. So you know the characters. Yes. Oh, so you're probably sick of it already. Yes. Ah, mm. I see. I will never willingly watch SpongeBob again. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last one we looked at was uh, the calling. Which is um, the sacred magic text of a prayer of resurrection and a local man who just happens to know how to decipher it. Mm. Arab, he was just hanging around. <laughs> <he? laughs> <laughs> Donald Sutherland, the arse. You know, come on, no, really, no, really. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of this. No, I, I, I'm not watching this. <laughs> <laughs> My foot is down. Yeah, foot oh, is down. Oh, Steve, you're going to be watching this. I uh, know. Yeah, no. you are. But, but you love when they mix genres together. Yeah. What if there's a serial killer thing happening? 
But wait, what if the serial killer is do, doing horror things and then that's two things? Yeah, and then we find a man who can interpret it and he's got this sacred text of the prayer of resurrection <laughs> that he just found down the back of the couch in his yeah. dusty old library. <laughs> that he you don't know. Oh, you don't know where he found it. Maybe he's the bad guy. Maybe <laughs> that's the twist. <laughs> Yeah, no. You know you're going to love it. No, 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 I'm not watching this. I'm not watching this. You, you're going to come back in six months when this no. comes out, and you're going to apologize to me. Sorry, I'm not going to waste my time with this. I don't think it's going to apologize. Is, it's very rare regardless. that I say I'm not watching something, and this is one of them. I'm not watching this. <laughs> the gauntlet is thrown. Yeah, yeah. High horse, I am. On. <laughs> yeah. We're already sawing the legs, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you. Um, what, speaking of sawing the legs off of a horse, I forgot <laughs> to tell you? <laughs> no, you know what, I'll leave it for another His brain is um, a little bit... So, are you going to watch this then? No, no. For no. the same reason? Uh, I, I don't even know what your reason is, except for that you got very upset very quickly. <laughs> oh, it's just silly. It's just silly. Um, I don't really, I don't tend to go for horror films when they're trying to, like, especially murder mysteries, mm-hmm. and I don't really care about the whole thing that there is something mysterious going on about yeah. the shape of the victim's mouth, that they're all saying Jesus. something. It's just, yeah. it just, none of it in- interests me. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, I won't watch it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna uh, put my, uh, put my money on the table and say that the climax of this movie is going to be a scene with Susan Sarandon with her makeup off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sean, you look like you're looking forward to it. I look like I saw a chief of police who happened to have a drinking problem and I went, oh good, this will be original. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think it'll be good. I, I wish Topher Grace was in good movies despite the fact that he's apparently a prick. Oh really? Oh really? Hmm. Apparently, yeah. Apparently, he's just like super pretty. Allegedly, people. allegedly, allegedly. I, I, I bet we'd be great friends though. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, that's it. Oh yeah, I meant to say, Chip. I started uh, Breaking Bad. Hey, congratulations! Yeah, yeah. I've got only a couple of episodes left in season one. Oh wow! Yeah. You're making your way through it quickly. Yeah, it's pretty good. It is pretty good, isn't yeah, it? It's yeah, pretty intense. It. Yeah, yeah. First few episodes are just like, whew. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, you know who I must throw another shout out to oh, is yes. uh, the guys over at Geek Legacy. Indeed, uh, they welcomed me onto their podcast. Uh, myself and Justin and Edmondson had a had a grand old time debating such topics as should the DC superhero movies be funny and whether or not uh, comic book characters should be drawn to look like porn stars with broken backs. <laughs> <laughs> so check that out. Uh, you know, that I was did. A lot of fun. I had a oh, listen. Yeah. yeah, as soon as it was tweeted and released, really enjoyed it. Yeah, good oh, show, excellent. Sean. Yeah. Well, thank you. They said I classed up the joint, which I guffawed at, and then went, you know what? They're onto something. <laughs> <laughs> I found some people who appreciate me for what I can do. <laughs> finally. <laughs> Sorry to cut across you there, now, Sean. Um, so that's it what, for what this week. What yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll leave it there. Uh, So from Mike, Sean, Shona and Steve, stay classy. (laughs) 